presence of God is here. And when he is manifesting himself so strong, before I ever preach tonight, God can do something great in our midst. So if one more time we could do a physical thing, I would like you to reach over and touch the person beside you. And what our general superintendent preached, faith could flow. Listen what God spoke. Before you pray, listen. Last night in my home, we had a mighty move of God with the general board and speakers and sponsors. And a prophecy went forth at the end of my meeting that God has come to this meeting to revive our emotions and to revive our minds, to revive our marriages and to revive our churches. So that prophecy that went forth right now with what our superintendent preached on faith tonight, by faith, I want you to lay hands on that person beside you and speak that prophecy into existence. I want to speak that prophecy into existence. I speak it over our bodies. I speak it over our emotions. I speak it into our spirits, a revival. A revival in our churches. A revival among our children. A revival like we have never seen. I speak a revival in our midst. We break every chain, every fetter, every doubt, every oppression, every depression, every spirit that's come against your God called men and women. We come against it in the name of Jesus. You said you would revive your works. Tonight we're speaking a gift of faith that you will revive your works. As an act of faith, could we give the Lord a hand clap of praise, claiming that in Jesus' name. God bless you. you may be seated. I give much honor to the general board. We had 45 members of the general board register for Because of the Times. Would you give our general board a... A hand, we're very honored to have them. Give honor to this church, this team that's worked so hard. To the shocks, I give honor. And then to my family, the Lumpkin side, and to the Mangans, Mike Yell, I'm so glad you're home. Would you give my family a hand? My mother, Mickey. Tonight I have come here with a... Uh, very passionate appeal. It is for incarnation, kingdom living ministry. One month ago, approximately, we celebrated the incarnation of our holy God, taking on human flesh in the form of Jesus Christ to pay the price for our sin and to redeem us to himself, God incarnate in human flesh, so that we could understand that we could become the incarnation of him, the glorious, eternal, holy one, who came to seek and to save that which was lost, knowing that Preaching is giving the Holy Bible a voice. For the next few minutes, I am the voice of that Holy Bible. So tonight, I realize that I must lift my voice like a trumpet. I realize to this great congregation that's come to this little old town of Alexandria that I must give a clear and definite sound. 
I know that we must make a strong, desperate appeal for every one of us to recover our first love and to seek him and make him more real to us than he has ever been. Oh, that we would become a people that are called out to be a people of the cross, consumed with his eternal purpose and passion. To make him first and foremost in our short lives that is but a hand breath. To seek him first as he told us to do on the Sermon on the Mount. Seek ye first my kingdom. Seek ye first my eternal purpose. Seek ye first the redemption of man. Kind, seek my will that no man or woman would ever have to spend eternity in a lake of fire. Seek my reason for coming to this earth. Understand what my kingdom is. And my kingdom is to seek and to save that which is lost. Then, please understand, he says, that my kingdom is not of this world. This world system and its values will soon pass away. So he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. God incarnate in human flesh so that we could become the incarnation of him the glorious eternal holy one seeking and saving that which is lost so tonight if we pray thy kingdom come then it is to incarnational living to what he came to do. He is not only the head of the church, which composes the body of the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, but that church is his chief heart interest. She is the central object and goal of the universe and all of history. This church was fearfully and wonderfully purchased. It's the only thing that he did not create. He can make stars. He can make other planets. He can speak into existence and there was creation. But when it came to his church, he did not create it. He purchased it with his own blood. And it is upon that church that he rests his coming to a manger, that he rests him carrying a cross up Golgotha's hill. It was on that church that he rested, that they would carry about the last day message to a lost world. He declared not only to preach it and live it, but like he really intended us to preach it and live it. Because let me tell you, he could start over any time he wanted to. He really doesn't need any of us, and he really don't need planet Earth. Because he's capable even now as God all by himself of making a creation and another human beings and other planets. But he could never do that. Because his omniscience would even be shaken if he thought he had to go through another Calvary. So it is from that cross that he cries, oh, that my church would become the incarnation of me that they might reach those that are lost. For he is not only the head of this church, 
He's the head of all things visible and invisible. Therefore, seeking him and his kingdom and praying, thy kingdom of God, you follow him with wholehearted abandonment. This isn't half hollowing following a God. You don't just half follow him. This is something that you commit to totally in your life. Jesus said, when you find that out, you'll go and find where I am. And if you want to find me, it's not going to be in your beautiful edifices nor in your sanctuary. But he said, you're going to find me with the least, the last, and the lost. Our time on earth is but a span. It should be making sure that first and foremost, that our relationship in our salvation with him is right. What he is doing in this world, I want to make sure that I'm joined up with what he wants done in this world. If I start any other place, if we start tonight getting the kingdom of God anywhere else besides ourselves, we will lose our way. He must be your pursuit. He must be your passion. He must be your desire. He must be your hope. He must be our message. He must be our mission. It's incarnation living ministry. I stand here as the Apostle Paul would if God would have saved him for this moment of hour. And I would say, I count not myself to have apprehended. For this one thing I do know. In other words, the sufferings, the journeys, the imprisonments, the beatings, all the perils, all the fasting orphans, all the hunger and all the cold, I still don't feel like I have apprehended that which has apprehended me. If we really want to see a visitation of the kingdom of God, it will be when we pursue that which has apprehended us and we apprehend him like he has apprehended us. I'm going to stretch. I'm going to push myself. I'm going to strive. I'm going to hunger. I am so thirsty. I am yearning. I am desiring for a rest, fresh revelation of the spirit and the power of God. I am reaching for the high prize of the calling of God. So to you great men and women of God, thy kingdom come is the second thing he prayed. The first thing he prayed was, hallowed be thy name. That name that is above every name. He taught us how to pray. It is called the Lord's Prayer. It is called the Disciples' Prayer. It is called the Model Prayer. The kingdom was ever on his mind. It is revealed in his preaching. It is revealed in his teaching, his kingdom. His parables, the many figures of speeches that he gives. That fame sermon on the mount that I read and reread today before I had the honor of standing before you. And the messages and the parables and the things he gave after he was 40 days out of the grave. When I look at those kingdom principles and teachings, you will find that over 40 parables reference that he taught because it was a parable that he would teach in Matthew he said so that you could understand the mystery of the kingdom. He said, I will talk in a parable so that you can understand the mystery of the kingdom. And then out of our 40 or so parables, he gives 19 of them that speaks our theme for this conference. 19 of the 40 talks about the kingdom of God. 
when you look at this thing that he is asking us to become an incarnation of, that thy kingdom come, that thy kingdom consume us, you will find he felt it so important that the book of Acts, that is our foundation, that all scholars from all denominations know and speak that where the church began. When you look at the bookends of the book of Acts, you will find from chapter 1, verse 3, he is preaching about the kingdom of God. When he closes chapter 28 and you find the last two verses of the book of Acts, he is preaching about the kingdom of God. Jesus wants the cause of the times to understand that we have the ability to be the incarnation of the kingdom of almighty God. We have the ability as his church to flesh out what he has called us to do. No wonder he said that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Which you can paraphrase me. The, para, the parable of God or the kingdom of God is not ritual and performance. But it is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It is the essence of the church. It is the essence. He wants to demonstrate it. He spoke about ages to come. He spoke about two ages. He spoke about the present age, which is from his birth to the rapture. It is referenced in the Word of God as the present age. And then he talked about the age that is to come, and that is the age when we shall be on the other side. I understand that of those 40 parables, some of those parables reference the next age that is to come. But if you will study those parables closely, most of the parables relate to this present age or the era that is between his cradle and our rapture, which is known as the present age. And what he wants to do in this present age, he wants to demonstrate his glory and he wants to demonstrate his power and he wants to do it through the church that is called by his name and that is filled with his spirit. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, thy kingdom come. What are we asking for? What is the kingdom of God? Jesus Christ through his church, the uniting of all things in him is the manifestation of God's ruling presence. It is wherever God rules and reigns over and in. If you want to find the kingdom of God, you show me anything that Jesus Christ is ruling over and ruling in, and you have found the kingdom of God. If we get in this meaning where that God is ruling over everything about us, and where that God is ruling over everything in us, we are going to have a visitation of the king like a church has never experienced. Jesus said, here is my message to you. I am the kingdom incarnate. In who I am, in who and what I do, and also in what I say. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. It is made visibly only through my church. So Anthony Magnan, you are a minister. You pastor the POA. But you have the opportunity to be the ark incarnation of almighty God. You have the opportunity to show the world what God really looks like. You can take a spiritual, invisible kingdom. And through you, Anthony, I can make myself visible and I can let the world see what my presence and what my glory really looks like. 
It means that I can bow before him in obedience to him and I can cry out, I surrender all to you, Jesus. It is hard for we North Americans to understand this. And most of you 18 nations, you great missionaries that have joined us, few of you are from kingdoms, some of you are, but even most of you missionaries are from where democracy is practiced. It's really hard for us to understand kingdom living because we are North Americans. Or either we're from a nation where there is a democracy. And when you look at democracy, it is where people rule. It is where people have their way. It is where people do what they want to do. People vote in their president. People vote in their senator. And people vote in their congressman. I thank God that I am in America. And I thank God that America is a democracy. But when it comes to the church of the living God, there is no democracy. It's not what I want. It's not what I think. It's not who I'm for. It's not who I'm against. I am in a kingdom. Our friends across the pond in England now understand that in England it's, it's there. And those of you from England, I love you. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we've got a queen over there, but you also have a prime minister. And you have the two that are there. No doubt the queen is now more for the pomp and the glory because making the laws are the congressmen, the sinners, and the prime ministers that are from the nation of England because you cannot coexist two together. You cannot bring a kingdom and you cannot bring a democracy and make them work together. And when it comes to the kingdom of God, you can't bring a democracy and you can't expect the kingdom of God to come. It's not what I vote for. It's not what I'm for. It's what the word of God and the commandments have forever been established. I don't have a right to govern myself. We're either going to receive this tonight or we're going to stay where we are. But I don't have a right to govern myself. No other minister nor your wife has a right to govern yourself. I don't care how big your church is. I don't care what position you hold in our organization. These men know how I honor them. But I'm going to tell you, none of us have a democracy in our lives. You cannot rule your own life. There is no man or woman in this room that can rule your own life. You're only one phone call away from your world being shattered. The only way you can rule your life is when you look at the king and say, I'm submitting myself to you. I'm in a kingdom. Well, I, I think this. I don't want to offend you because I'm saying it to myself. He don't really care what you think. Well, I think we ought to be, he don't really care what you think. He doesn't really care what Anthony Mangan thinks. He don't really care. Well, I want to be happy. I'll do with my marriage what I want to be happy with. Happiness is killing us. They've got on television shows the American Idol. Let me tell you who's going to be crowned the new American Idol. Ha who? Happiness is the new thing. That has become America's idol. It don't matter what God says. It doesn't matter what God puts down. It doesn't matter what his commandment is. I've got a right to be happy. So you're moving into a democracy where it's about you instead of it being about him. 
This isn't about whether I'm happy or you're happy. I want to be happy. But it's about what thus saith the word of the Lord. It's about the kingdom principles that God has laid down. So I want to get under him. I want my family under him. Mickey, I want us under him. We can't have a little bit of democracy. We can't have 90% kingdom living and 10% of what we want. You don't give God 10%. You don't build a kingdom at POA. It's not what I want for the POA. It's not what Mickey and I think needs to happen at the POA. It's what God wants for the POA. It's not what I think ought to happen. It's what God thinks ought to happen. I preached to this church opening up the first Sunday. I made my mind up. I'm submitting to his kingdom. I am going to sell out to his kingdom. I am going to live for his kingdom. There's only one place to go. He is the ruler and he is the king. Mickey, it's not about what we want. It's not about what we think. If you're going to have thy kingdom come, then you got to get rid of yourself and your democracy and what you want, and you got to get under the kingship of the Lord. Rule, O king. Let your laws live in me, O God. Let me live in your kingdom, O God. Let me live in your kingdom. You reign over me, God. Let your will be done in my life. Let me move my stinking self out of the way. Let me strip myself of everything that's Anthony, oh God. Let me put everything aside and let me yield to your kingdom so that your will can be done in my life. We have messed our thinking up because we think that power resides in a particular person, maybe in our organization or a power here in our church. You let me tell you, power doesn't reside in a person. Power resides in a place. He that abideth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in Almighty God. Power is not in a person, it's in a place. It's where we've got to go and it's where we've got to get. We've got to get in that place with him where we can hear what God is saying and knowing that God has spoken to this church and that God has spoken to us and that God has given us a clear word. Because if you don't, democracies change. What, one week ago, we elected a new senate. And there are many hoping that that Senate changes laws that were made in 2014. They're hoping that certain bills will be repealed. And we've got a new Congress and a new Senate that has the ability to repeal laws that were made in 13 and 14. Because we elected in a democracy a new system. But in the kingdom of God, there is no new president. In the kingdom of God, there is no new senate. In the kingdom of God, there is no group of people. In the kingdom of God, you don't change the laws every week. You don't change it. You don't change your message to fit the culture. You change the culture to fit your message if you're in the kingdom of God. You don't vote this out. You don't, you don't change this. When you get a new pastor, it don't change. We get a new superintendent in many years to come, or we get general board changes in and out. It don't change what thus saith the word of the Lord. We're not a democracy. We're a kingdom, and we got to line up with the kingdom principles and the things of God. 
So I'm going to give you three things tonight and I will be done. But number one, we need a baptism of kingdom power. We need to understand faith and the power of the incarnation. We need to understand what God has given us. It's the only power that can convict and convince and draw people to Jesus Christ. The only power that can bring the restoration of things. We need to understand there's power in this kingdom. By the power of preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. The Bible says men's hearts were set free. Jesus preached miracles. And I'm not going to get here and be the incarnation of Almighty God and not Preach miracles. Thank you, Brother Superintendent. Thank you. We are going to have the miraculous. He said, Colossians 1 and 3. He said, from the power of darkness I will deliver them. And I have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. We must understand when Jesus said in uh, the opening chapter of the book of Acts, O Theophilus, we are going to begin. Notice the order. That that Jesus did and taught. He did and then he taught. What would happen in our churches if we ever get the gifts of the Spirit operating in our churches and the gift of healing get to falling in our midst. You forgive me just a moment, but I am here to rattle our cage, our dead churches, our dead song services, our dead preaching, our dead saints. I've come here to declare against dead churches. We need a revival of apostolic power. There's no ever tougher. There was no place any tougher than when Jesus walked into those Jews and he was saying, I have come. They said, well, who are you? Well, let me show you who I am. He started opening blind eyes and then stopping deaf ears. And this is what they said in Luke. If the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come to us. If we can get to casting out devils, having miracle signs and wonders, the people will back up and say, thy kingdom has come. The incarnation. He walked in doing miracles, Matt. He walked in doing miracles. He walked in miracles. And we're being satisfied with having our churches and our baptistries empties and our altars empties and nobody getting saved and nobody having revival. We need a waking up of what God's called us to do. You may be seated. John the Baptist got to saying, well, is he, I introduced him. Uh, uh, is this him or do we look for another? Jesus didn't even go to his funeral. He simply said this, you go tell John that the blind see, the eyes are being opened, the deaf ears are being unstopped. When you tell John, the Messiah is here. And if you want to know where the true church is, get to looking for the people where the eyes are being opened and the deaf ears are being understood and the doctrine is being proclaimed. I pray that God release us into the supernatural power of Almighty God. That God releases our churches into a fresh anointing of Almighty God. Maybe see this. They got to they got to casting out devils, and so Matthew twelve. He said, "Well, the bells above casting them out." And the Lord said, "Well, how can a devil cast out a devil?" So you get to verse twenty eight. He said, "But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God there's the word. Then the kingdom of God has come to you." 
He said, if you see miracle signs and wonders, you understand that the kingdom of God has come to you. And when you read that early church, when you lead Jesus and you get to Acts 4, when Peter and John were threatened, they just got to praying and the place was shaken and they were all, that's one of our problems, only part of us, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They were all refilled with the Holy Ghost. Everything talked in tongues. They spake the word of God with boldness. And then... By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they with one accord in Solomon's porch insomuch that they brought forth the sick and the streets and they laid them on the beds and the couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow them. There came also a multitude out of the city. Everybody say multitude. multitude. I didn't want you to say it. I wanted you to shout it. That was my fault. Shout multitude. And a multitude came out of the cities. They came from everywhere to Jerusalem bringing sick folks and them which were vexed of unclean spirit and they were healed, every one of them. That's the apostolic church. And somewhere, someplace, sometime, God's going to have a church before the rapture that's having a book of Acts revival. Hi, may be seated. You great bunch of PKs. Pastor Terry recognized y'all. We're so glad you're here. They love us so much, parents. They love you so much that they voted last year that this is the only time they want to be with us. So instead of coming back Thursday night, they're doing their own thing over there. But you let me tell you great bunch of young people something. There is this thing called the gifts of the Spirit that's operated in our church for years. And God wants to raise some of you up. I've got to look around the POA. And a couple of Sundays ago, we had the spirit of prophecy in this church. And my mother, when I got through preaching, she prophesied. We had tongues and interpretation. But when I looked around, it was the people my age or older that were given the tongues interpretation. And God gave me a good shaking. He said, what are you doing? Where is your young people? Where is your journey? Where is your young married couples? Where are they? that can say, thus saith the word of the Lord, and the word be done. You may be seated. How long has it been since you had tongues and interpretation in your church? How long has it been since we had the gift of prophecy in our church? Tonight, on the authority of the name of Jesus, I lose the gifts of the Spirit in this congregation tonight that God will operate in our midst. You may be seated. Dare we get here, Pastor Terry to appeal. Dare we get here and preach about Yuza touching the ark and he fell dead. Do you know we have the ark of the covenant? Dare we get to this hour and not go through whatever we got to go through to get to the holy of holies where the ark of the covenant can manifest itself in our congregation and God can operate in our churches. I declare that the gifts of the Spirit must be working we cannot depend on the glory of the past. We have been called to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind. We have been called to set at liberty them that are bound. We have been called. If we don't get Holy Ghost power, demonstration, and gift. More than a creed in our Constitution. We're going to become barren. There must be a demonstration in our services of the power of God. Bible said that early church went everywhere and the Lord worked signs and wonders confirming that the kingdom was among them. Thank God for our buildings. Thank God for our doctrines. But when you look at this, he said, you better not put your light 
under a bushel. Our four walls is not where the church is supposed to be. Our church is supposed to be in the grocery store, the supermarket, having miracles, signs, and wonders. Woe be unto us if we depend on our programs and our music and our preaching and our light shows and our smoke. And I'm not against any of that. But woe be unto us if we get down to our programs now that we've got enough money to pay our bills and our membership is large enough to assure our future. Woe be unto us if we lay aside the message of deliverance that God has laid upon us. Woe be unto us. We better not be dependent on a church, on an organization, on a seminary, on a program, or nothing else to produce an apostolic move of God. We better get under this throne and say, God, I'm going to position myself to have an apostolic revival. If we're not careful, these are going to become school pupils instead of barracks. We're going to produce students instead of soldiers. We need spirit and truth, and there's got to be a combination. We've got to have a revival of the Holy Ghost. My kingdom come. So the kingdom must have power. The second thing is, the kingdom must have posture. My mother and father came to this city. It's the only reason because of the times is here. And thank you for the honor you give to Mickey and I in this great church. But it's because my mother and daddy came here 65 years ago this July. I don't have a right to change the core values that they taught this church. You must have an unshakable immovable love for the apostolic truth. You must love the posture of our churches have been a love for the word of God. We have believed this to be the infallible word of God. Why are we moving into a day to where we're questioning whether Jonah got swallowed by a fish? We're questioning why would we ever get here in this day and time and start questioning this book. Our posture as apostolics have been, we believe this to be the infallible word of God. We even believe the maps are inspired. We've been people of prayer. Jesus lived that Sermon on the Mount. It referenced, he refused to go teach, he refused to go preach until he had spent a night or time in prayer. My sweet brothers and sisters, the kingdom is all about his word, prayer and fasting and souls and discipleship and winning the lost. That is what the posture of the kingdom is all about. And the supreme indictment against a preacher's ministry, including mine, is the absence of seeking and saving the loss, the absence of spending nights in prayer and a relationship every morning that you start your day off with God. I do not understand anybody that can start their day off. I will get to it later in the day. I do not know. You don't pastor people like the POA. Because, and they're great people, but they're people. They're flesh. Whoa, beyond. If I don't wake up in the morning and before my day starts. That I start following his step as a prayer warrior, seeking through prayer. When do you pray? I pray when I don't feel like it. 
Well, then when you don't feel like it, how long do you pray? I prayed I feel like it. <laughs> Prayer is not a matter of choice. It's a matter of obedience. Pray. Oh, God, we got to pray. We do so much preparing to pray, but we never pray. We got so many books on prayer, we read ourselves to death on prayer, but we never pray. We'll go here, Mother, General Conference, and Mother lay us all out on the floor. And we're all going to do better, and then we go and we don't pray. God's kingdom is going to have posture. It's going to have to be people that know how to pray and know how to fast. And you check the make great men and women of God of this book. And Noah built an altar and Abraham and Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Gideon and Samuel and David. It's very noticeable they built altars. I'll tell you one who didn't. Lot didn't build an altar. Find out how he ended up. Can't make it without an altar. Tomorrow I will leave at about 10 to 11 when Pastor Terry's wrapping up. And I will leave and go speak at the 13th funeral that I have preached <clears throat> in the last, since December the 30th. Saturday at 10 o'clock, I have the number 14 funeral since I preached since December the 30th. I have preached some funerals of some great people. But the toll that has taken on me these last three weeks have been foundation members of this church. Let me just give you one because there's many I can name but her name was Barbara Nichols. And Barbara won souls here. She won the Forbes and she won the rights. But she helped us start a daughter work in Cottonport. They figured out when they gave her her memorial service in Cottonport that if you figured out all the miles, she drove down there two or three times a week. She had over 15,000 miles to about 45 miles to one of our daughter works. The Saturday before she was put into the hospital to where she eventually stayed until a couple days before she died and they took her home to die. Barbara knocked 34 doors in Cottonport with cancer eating her body up and very weak. And she was able to get 15 or 20 to church on her last Sunday at the church she loved. And they baptized 10 of them in the name of Jesus. It is, young people. That's what you call the posture of the kingdom. We're people of power, and we've had a posture of loving this book, of loving the Word of God and its doctrine, and loving prayer, and loving fasting. I was raised on prayer, fasting, word, and a lost world. And I close with a third thing about the kingdom, and that is the purity of the kingdom of God. It's a powerful kingdom. It's a posturing kingdom. It's a pure kingdom. But as he which hath called you is holy, you be holy. In all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. That commandment leaves no loopholes for anyone. God is calling the apostolic church to pure living. It's a holy ghost. It's a holy name. It's holy oil. It's the holy one of Israel. It's holy people. It's the holy temple. It's a holy heaven where the angels cry, holy, holy, holy. It's Isaiah 6 that this choir sang about. 
Isaiah, when he lost his crutch, he looked up and he saw the Lord high and lifted up in the temple. And he cried, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. Then an angel came with a live coal of fire from the altar of heaven, and he touched his lips, and the sin was purged, and his iniquity was taken away. And then he fulfilled what God had called him to do. And you can read the book of Isaiah, where he gave us such oneness scriptures. He gave us Isaiah 9 and 6. He gave us that powerful book, but it wasn't until he had a pure cleansing of his life of seeing the holiness of God who shall abide in the tabernacle and dwell in a holy hill but he that walketh uprightly he that worketh righteousness he that speaketh truth in his heart he that backbiteth not with his tongue nor doeth evil to his neighbor nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor in whose eyes a vile person is condemned but he honoreth them that fear the Lord he that sweareth to his own hurt and change not he that putteth not out money to usury and taketh reward against the innocent he that doeth these things shall never be moved. My sweet brothers and sisters, we serve a holy God. And if we are going to get into his kingdom, it is going to be in his holiness. My pastor tweeted out something the other day. He said, when you hear the word holiness, what do you think? If we ever get our thinking right, when we say holiness, it won't be Article 6, Section 3, Paragraph 2 of 6,328 pages of our manual. But when you think of holiness, it will be an affirmation that you have to sign. When you think of holiness, you will think of a holy God who is high and lifted up and his train fills the temple. If we only have rules to follow in the kingdom, but we don't have a relationship with the king, we're going to get in trouble. we got to have our rules. We are a separate group of people. We don't need to change what we preach or teach or believe. But what I am shouting to you is, if we do our do's and don'ts without a relationship with the king, we are headed for religious legalism. If we don't have a relationship with God. We got to have a relationship with God to where you still do the do's and don'ts, but you do it because you love him. You want to be holy. You want to walk holy. You don't want to go there. You don't want to dress in modest. You don't want to walk like the world. You don't want to talk like the world because you got a relationship. With Talking about God taking us to a place of consecration. He said, oh, your righteousness are as filthy rags before me. You can't do it. That's democracy. You can't get holy enough. There's only way you can do it. It's what Brother Kilgore used to step at our conferences and begin. To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. On earth I long to be like Jesus. Hebrews 12 said, pure holiness is when you lay down your pride. You let me tell you one of the greatest sins among us. And I'm giving you my heart and my voice, and you get angry with me if you want. But pride is the number one sin of us. God needs to strip us. God needs to turn us inside out. God needs to humble us before him. We need to humble ourselves before him. If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves, we got to humble ourselves before him. Jonathan Edwards said, 
I go to preach with two propositions in mind. First, every person ought to give his life to Jesus Christ. Second, whether anyone else gives his life or not, I will give mine. If nobody else gives their life to the Lord, God, I'll give you mine. If nobody else wants to live holy, I'm going to give you mine. Nobody else, if everybody walks away and everybody says this and everybody says that, I don't give a flip. I'm going to give you mine. The king is the holiness of God. Let me preach on holiness a while. I'll do it with the Bible. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking that's among us. Put it away. We can't even get along in the same city with our brother. We need a holy God to invade us. Be ye kind one to another. Be tender-hearted. Be forgiving. Get holy before you. Empty everything else. He said on that sermon on the mount. Oh God, I got to read. I should have never read it because I, I was fixing this thing and this hit me at six o'clock. When you get to Matthew, he said, Now hold on just a minute. I've laid out the kingdom, I've given you all the blessing. But but before I end my sermon, let me just give you a few extra notes. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But it's he that does the will of the Father. It's he that's not in a democracy but lives in my kingdom, which is in heaven. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Now, come on, we're not getting to the book. We're not into, we're not into apostles and prophets now. Everybody likes to take what Jesus said. Let's take what Jesus said right here. They prophesied in my name. They cast out devils in my name. And in my name, they've done many wonderful works. And then what I profess unto them, I never knew ye depart from me. You work iniquity. You knew the kingdom law, but you didn't know the king. We knew his name, but we didn't know him. We knew his doctrine, but we didn't. No, him. I said, God, I had quite an afternoon today. I said, God, please, as an apostolic church, don't let us lose our desire to pray and fast and dress separated from this world and our apostolic doctrine of repentance, baptism, and amen, filling the Holy God, don't let us lose those core values. And I thought, been on it for weeks. Right? And I'm done. Right? Before Raymond, they cross over. They're in Jordan. Getting ready to cross over. Getting ready to cross over. Balak looks at these powerful people. 3,400 strong. Wow. I need something to curse them. So I'll get me a hireling preacher. Come here, Balaam. Come here, Balaam. Look at these people. They're powerful. They're destroying every ike they come up against. That's what you preached. I leaned to Terry. I said, he's preaching my message. They've taken down every ike there is. They're taking down everything. The hand of God is upon them. Curse them. Okay. And Balaam steps up to curse. And he said, I can't curse what God has blessed. And he blesses them. They're praying people. They're fasting people. They're living separated from the world. They're living holy and godly. They got me as the sinner in the circumference of their life. I can't bless them. I can't curse them. I can only bless them. Well, come over here. So he takes them to another place. Come look at them at another angle. Look at them now. And he said, curse them. And he raised his hand. And he went to curse them. And he couldn't curse them. 
So he said a third time, come on, let's look one more time. you got to do it. They're going to take everything in sight. They believe it in miracles. They got excited at BOTT. They're going to accomplish everything. They finally waking up to what they got and who they are. You got to curse them because if they get in Jordan, it's going to be, you got to curse them, curse them. And he steps up and he says, I can't do nothing but bless them. We're blessed people. Now, now, let's leave Deuteronomy, uh, Numbers 23 and 24. And let's jump all the way over 400 years of silence in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Whoa, but you don't want to go over into June. Whoa, let's go fast. First chapter where John's in the spirit of the Lord's day. And he saw him and his, his eyes and his hair was white and his a flame of fire. And let's jump over that. And let's land in the seven churches of Revelation. And let's go through the first two and let's get down to this church that is called Pergamos. And when you get to the church of Pergamos, he starts reading to them a very powerful thing. Revelation 2, 13. Oh, Pergamos, I know thy works. Thy dwellest even where Satan's seed is. Thou holdest fast my name. You have not denied the doctrine or the faith. Even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But, oh Pergamos, that kept my name and hadn't denied the faith, I still have something against you. For there is among you the doctrine of Baal. So let's lead Revelation 2. Let's go back over our 400 years of silence and let's land back in the book of Numbers. What is the doctrine of Balaam? Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespasses against their Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. The doctrine of Balaam in Revelation 2.14 is the doctrine of Balaam is this, what he could not curse, he contaminated. He said, it doesn't matter if you'll give this up. It doesn't matter if you'll give that up. And when you read number 25, and Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredoms with the daughters of Moab, and they called the people unto the sacrifice of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Bilpur, and Israel joined himself unto Bilpur, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. In other words, he said, you cannot curse these people, but what you can do is get wellness among them. Let them think you don't have to pray. Just let them think you don't have to fast. Just let them think you don't have to be separated from the world. Just let them think. Let it mingle together. And then before you know it, we'll all be at the Moabite Baal God, worshiping that God. But I've got a feeling that there's a group of people that's got their mind made up. You may be seated. So just before, I'm done, but just before the rapture, just before we cross over, we great men of God that raised five million dollars in their services at Zenith Conference, that the hand of God has been on them over there. Right before the rapture, he came. We're too strong. We're too powerful. We've been too united. He can't curse us. But what he'll try to do is contaminate us. And young men, if you're thinking about changing your belief, don't you talk to your peers. You better find an elder in your life to speak into your life. So, Brother Tenney, 
I went out to my daddy's grave today. I didn't even take a chair. I got on the ground. Before I did, I went over to Brother Lumpkin's grave. And I thanked him, Jim, for standing for the truth. And I thank Mom for all that work they did on that Arkansas County. They built houses that we now live in and vineyards that we now eat from. And we don't realize the blessings of God. And I left there and my, my Popsy Gibson is at the foot of my daddy's grave. And I didn't know it till Brother Prince and them told me about him. Brother Prince, I enjoyed being at your camp so much. But Mark, my grandfather, stuff I didn't even know about him. He established, Ken, seven churches in East Texas. The first church in Lufkin, Texas. The first church built there, my grandfather established it. He built churches all over East Texas. My mother pulling on her accordion and singing. That's where my daddy met my mother at 17 years of age. I said, Pop, see what you think about all that. He didn't answer me. <laughs> so I finally ended up at Dad's grave. That's what I went out there for. Because he built the foundation of this church. And I sat down and I said, Dad, there's some saying that prayer's not important. There's some saying, Dad, that fasting and having revival, Dad. I remember my early years, Dad, when we came here. And I remember even going at conferences and they'd laugh at you and Mother. They said, even in the United Pentecostal Church, that all you did was shout people, Dad. They said, Mother would take an aisle with the accordion. Daddy would take a tambourine and... They didn't do a lot of preaching. They just did a bunch of shouting. And oh, God, they just didn't know. I said, Dad, they said all this worship and praise doesn't matter anymore. They said, don't get emotional about what we have anymore. Dad, there's a lot of people changing a lot of things. I said, uh, but before we close and I go back to preach tonight, I want to tell you, Dad, that there is a slew of men and women that ain't changing nothing. You may be seated. You may be seated. I said, Dad, I said, uh, I was with some young preachers after we dismissed last night, and Dad, they're fanatical about reaching the lost. They said, let's go, Pastor Mannion. Let's pray, let's fast. Let's, him, let's live holy. Let's live godly. Let's have the power of the kingdom. Let's have the posture of the kingdom. Let's have the purity of the kingdom. Let's go. And I said, Daddy, you got a bunch that's living this like you and your peers lived it in the first place. And I said, you want to know? And I said, how do you know, Dad? I'll tell you how I know. I inspected them a while ago. I inspected their attitude. I inspected their shoes. I inspected their uniform. I inspected their weapon. I expect the helmet. They got on the same thing with maybe more zeal than we ever had. That's how I know. Come here, Brother Haywood. Come here, Brother Foss. Come here, Brother Gilgore. Come here, Pa. Popsy Gibson. Come over here. Come with me a minute. Come with me, Brother Norris. Come with me. I want us to look over the banister of heaven and see what's going on in planet Earth. As we all look, wow! They're preaching the same thing we preach. They got the same tone of voice. And they're preaching it just exactly like we preached it. 
and we hit him. But just in case, there'd be a compromiser down there. And they go by my tomb in Forest Lawn. In the name of Jesus and by the authority of the anointing that has rested on me, I am calling this church to a time of repentance, of holiness to a holy God like we've never seen. I ask no one to leave because I am not through with this service. I have another demonstration. But I ask you to fall on your face or get on your knees. And I ask there to be a cry out to God that we can have kingdom power, kingdom posture, and kingdom purity. I would love for the young people to lead out in prayer. I would love for the elders to lead out in prayer. I would love for there to be a cry. If you can't get on your knees, you're welcome to sit in your seat. Some of you have age and knee problems but could there be a revival you can dim the lights just a little bit to be a cry of repentance. Seeking a holy God. Putting backbiting out of our way. Putting bitterness out of our way. There needs to be a seeking of the face of God. Could ever a preacher lift his voice right now? Could a man of God lift his voice? Could a man of God lift our voice into repentance?
Can we invite the holiness of God in us like we have never invited the holiness of God? Can we invite the holiness of God into our life like we've never invited the holiness of God? Ladies, travail. Would the ladies speak out in travail right now? That's it. Would the ladies speak out in travail right now? Could travail go forth right now? Could travail go forth right now? That's it. Could travail go forth right now? you're sitting 
or where you're kneeling. If you'll look at the seat by you in front of you, you will see a little card like this that is on your seat. I want to tell you that there's been much prayer and fasting that's been put over these little envelopes. I know people, people of God, that have prayed and fasted. If you will pull that card out of that envelope, on the authority and the power of the name of Jesus. I want you to begin to write names of people that are not saved. Or names of family members that you need to see their life changed. Or healing. Whatever miracle you need to happen in your life or your home. Would you get a pen or pencil right now? If our ushers or hostesses could help a lot of our PKs don't have pens. If you would share, if you would write your names and share your pen or pencil. We're getting ready to have a mass prayer for these, not only with what POA has done, but this congregation is getting ready to pray. And I'm going to tell you in the name of Jesus that God's going to start moving for this prayer request that you're getting ready to put in here. There's been praying and fasting. This is what our junior super talked about. The gift of faith now has to operate. So you write any name or names on that. Would you do that right now? Just close your eyes and everybody be in prayer. Said everybody just be in prayer. That's it. Just be in prayer. When you get it written, if somebody needs your pen, let them borrow it. Are we still waiting on anyone? If you're not done, just raise your hand. If you're not done, okay, go ahead. We'll give you just a few more minutes. Let them borrow your pen back here. We're getting ready to see God move. These are prayer requests. I saw a couple of hands raised. I know what their request is. And I'm going to be praying with them. God's going to do a work here. God's going to do a work. everybody done if you would put that back into your envelope and if you will seal it and if you would all stand right now in the name of Jesus we're going to lift that towards the Lord Now, I'm not going to have anyone come and pray. We're getting ready to pray. God, I'm bringing this petition before you. Now lift your voice as men and women of God. You will intercede. Oh, God. You will answer this request. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Let your holiness manifest itself in this room. Let miracles happen in this room right now, oh God. happen in this room, oh God. That's my prayer request. That's my father. That's my mother. That's my husband. That's my wife. That's my children. That's my family. They're going to be saved. My family's going to be saved. 
my church. Hold it up to you, God. You're in our midst, oh God. Your holiness is in our midst. Your holiness is going to fill this place right now. A glory cloud is going to cover us. You have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. We have come to the kingdom for such a time. tonight in a special way. We have reached the Holy of Holies tonight. We feel your presence. The glory cloud is hovering over us right now. Your glory and your power is in this place. Your presence, your Shekinah glory. The 
Let's walk in power. Let's walk in posture. And let's walk in purity. Remember, you have been called to flesh out what Jesus came to do. Don't lose the purpose of the church, and that's to seek and to save lost people. May God be with you. Don't everybody, we haven't had anybody leave here. If it is, it's just been one or two. Look across this place is packed. People have been captured by the presence of the king. When we line up with his kingdom, we are ruled by him. Don't be in a hurry to leave. They will get you out of here as fast as they can. The state police and the police and, and our parking people will work. But why don't you hug one another's neck and go to somebody and tell them you love them. Why don't the fellowship of the brothers and sisters. 9.30 in the morning. Oh, let me tell you what we're doing with these. Everybody, listen, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. This is like the red bandana. I'm asking you if you carry things in your Bible. I'm asking you to put this in your Bible. And until it's answered, you carry this in your Bible, either to the rapture or until it's answered. You made a commitment to God and God's going to answer it. Put it in your Bible and don't take it out. I love you all much. See you in the morning at 930.